about tonight. Because what I hope you get out of this is that you'll hear from individuals who are running these businesses every day, again, the successes, the challenges, and the outlook. So I wanted to start with Jane, um, because I gave her a little bit of a heads up yesterday that I wanted to ask this question. So the question to you, Jane, is can you walk us through the calculus of the decision to sell the bakery? And kind of a related question that's a little bit step back from that is, is that a viable or what, is that a viable exit strategy for social enterprise? Thank you, Jason. Uh, it definitely was very viable for for us. Um, and in terms of your question, you you framed it very in a very eloquent way. So the. Uh, the decision to sell the bakery was very long in the making, and I think a lot of people have known Rubicon for its bakery, and that's really in, gotten us you know, onto the radar screen in places that, uh, what was then an East Bay or Richmond-based uh, service organization wouldn't necessarily have gotten us known. Um, so we, I think, it's safe to say we're known to some extent internationally for our bakery um, and we've always been very proud of the bakery and at the same time the bakery uh, was a, a part of something larger. Um, we over a number of years were looking at the difficulty of the business model for the bakery and the board and management of Rubicon um, grappled with this issue over a number of years and essentially uh, came to the decision, really uh, started talking explicitly about it uh, a couple of years before the sale actually was executed and looking at different options um, for how we could you know, continue the legacy of the bakery, uh, continue the employment of the Rubicon Bakery employees, um, and make it a win-win both for the bakery and for Rubicon programs. Uh, for people who may not be aware, Rubicon programs, uh, as it says, has been around about 36 years and we were started as a mental health uh, community-based organization for people who were being uh, released from institutions uh, in the early 70s. And we were started as a mental health service organization and we kind of grew like Topsy to do all sorts of different things, including running these businesses. And the first one was actually one that was the predecessor of our commercial landscape business. Um, and then the second one was uh, a predecessor of Rubicon Bakery. Um, but back to uh, the recent past, the, so the last couple of years we were looking at how can we make this a success both for the larger organization, we're about a $14 million organization and the bakery um, was, is, um, and I'm, I've been trying to get out of the business of saying our bakery, um, the bakery is about a, a $2 million annual business. So again, a part of um, a larger piece. And really, uh, we started talking to business brokers and consultants uh, to determine what kind of um, shape a business transaction could take in terms of conveying the ownership. And uh, we were very fortunate in that uh, the best uh, potential buyer was the only buyer. And um, it was actually a matter of finding someone through word of mouth who was connected, had an intergenerational connection to the baking industry, uh, was not presently in it, had, uh, operates a successful restaurant, lives locally, uh, wanted a new challenge, loved the mission of the bakery, and we were very fortunate that he had the generosity and the commitment to come on as the volunteer general manager um, in the first half of 2009. So he saw it as a win for him because he got to see the business from the inside and it was definitely a win for us because we gained his expertise and quite frankly we were not having to pay a general manager. Um, the business transaction itself was probably less simple than the site control for the building, which we've never owned. 
Um, so we had a long-term lease with an option to purchase and the owner of the building challenge, our, our right matured in a couple years ago and the heir to the estate of the building owner challenged our rights. So the sale took a little longer because of course he wasn't interested in buying a business that didn't have site control. Um, but we, a couple people asked me at the beginning, uh, did you sell the business? And, and in a literal sense, and I, I'm very aware there are experts in the room on the legal side, and I am not, um, we did not literally sell the business. We have licensed the name. Um, as I said, he hired all of our employees, which was a key you know, criterion for us. And he's licensed the name. He is going. He is applying for B Corporation status so that we can depend on the B Corporation people to monitor the social purpose uh, nature of his business so we don't have to be in the business of monitoring that. Um, I'm really pleased to say that during the holiday rush, he hired an additional 45 local Richmond people to, to work, and he was running the business 24-7, seven days a week. Um, when Rubicon Programs was managing the business, we never had a three shift going at a time. And I think that's partly um, the nature of what a nonprofit can and can't do in terms of staffing um, and what it can ask of employees. He, as a sole entrepreneur, was basically living at the bakery building. Um, so really throwing his soul into it. Um, and so in terms of how revenues are coming back to Rubicon, we've licensed the name and as the business grows, increasingly large shares of the, uh, the net profit will be coming back to Rubicon program. So that may be more than you wanted to hear, but that's, that's, that's what happened and we really consider it a win-win and uh, he's right down the street and uh, it's, he's, he's really part of the larger Rubicon family and um, the Rubicon Bakery continues um, to, to be part of the family even though it's not in a corporate way part of it.